event. Make sure you have a pencil or pen and some paper on hand for this fun and engaging session. Have you ever wondered why glue is sticky? Or are birds really dinosaurs? This is explored in a new book called Why Does My Shadow Follow Me? And I have a copy right here. It's an amazing book. And today I will be joined by special guest Kira Vermond, author of the book, and Saharu Ogawa, the illustrator of the book. Once again, make sure you have that pen and paper around so that you could draw along with Saharu as the questions are being read. Also, we would love to hear from you. So please type your questions in the chat below, as well as any questions that you may have for the author an illustrator, maybe like what inspired them to become authors or illustrators, or inspired the questions from the book. And we'll try to get as many to as many questions as we can as possible. I would like to start with the land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that we are participating in this event on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous people from the beginning. We are speaking to you today from the city of Toronto. We acknowledge that the land we live on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Acknowledging the relationship to this land is an ancient practice, and today we express our gratitude for the opportunity to be here. And we thank all generations of people who have taken care of this land since time immemorial. Thank you. And so I, once again, I'd like to say welcome to Kira and Saharu. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this book has so many great questions from children in it. Also, it's, I just want to mention that it's available through our website and at anicrest.ca. Uh, Kira, I want to turn it over to you to start us off. Oh, oh, Sean, and it's so nice to see your face and to hear your voice because I interviewed you for this book as well, right? Like you were part of the process. <laughs> so cool. So yeah, what we're going to be doing today, guys, is um, I'm Kira Vermont. I'm the author of Why Does uh, My Shadow Follow Me? Why Don't Cars Run on Apple Juice, which was the first book. And Suharu, who are you? How do you fit into all of this? Well, uh, my name is Suharu. I'm the illustrator for those two books. So I work with Science Center, I work with Kira, and I also work with everyone, the kids. Mm -hmm. These are some beautiful illustrations that Suhar uh, worked on for the, for the book. So I'm gonna ask everybody, we're gonna start things off by doing this. I'm gonna ask you to do two things. The first thing I want everybody to do is put your hand on your back. And then I want you to start patting. And I don't can't see you at home, but I'm sure you're doing it. I am sure you are. And don't go too hard, don't go too hard. I don't want anybody to get hurt. Okay, you can stop now. You can stop patting your back. So the reason why I wanted you to pat your back today is because you deserve thanks. You know what, we talk about you know wonderful doctors and nurses and uh, teachers and first responders, emergency people, people who are doing everything they can to sort of get us through this pandemic. But you know what, we don't thank the kids often enough, right? Like I think, you know, exactly, because I'm thinking, you know, you know, you guys have to wear masks. You have to um, not go to school or go to school or stay away from your friends and do all this learning online. And no kids in the history of kids have ever had to do that before. And it's really kind of tough. And you guys are doing such a beautiful job. And I know some days maybe it doesn't feel like you're doing a beautiful job, but you are. And so the next 30 minutes is for you. It's for you to feel good about yourself and to just enjoy and relax. And we're gonna have fun. We're gonna tell stories and, uh, you know what? No tests. We don't have to test it. <laughs> All good. All good. So Suhara is going to draw live draw. She has a superpower that I don't even know if you knew you had until recently. So <laughs> <laughs> she's going to draw and just come up with stuff as I read. And Sean's going to do some fantastic um, experiments as we go too. So the second thing I'm going to ask everybody to do now is get up. Yeah, saying all of that, if you can, if you're if you're able, we'll have different abilities, and we're going to jump. We're gonna hop. Everybody hop. Okay, and then you can like run on the spot if you want. Whatever you want to do, jump. You can dance. Whatever. Okay, that's fantastic. You can all sit down. You can all sit down again. And if you are not able to get up and jump and run and stuff like that, not a problem. You can think of your least favorite person in the world doing, you know, jumping and hopping and looking silly. That's okay. That works too. All right. So the reason why I asked you 
to jump and hop is it relates to the very first um, <laughs> question I'm gonna ask from this book. That was a question that a, some kids have come up with. It is, <laughs> why do we have butts? And I think it's one of my favorites. So it's on page 26, I'm just gonna get there. Why do we have butts? Somebody asked this question, here is the answer. Love to run or hop or jump, thank your butt. Human butt cheeks are fast, are fast and squishy, but they also house the largest muscle in the entire body, the gluteus maximus. It does the important job of moving the hips and thighs. Every time you climb stairs, bend down, jump rope or run, this powerhouse muscle goes to work. What's more, it keeps you upright on two legs, a very human trait. So, I mean, if we didn't have our butt, then we wouldn't be able to walk and stand on two legs, which is kind of interesting. We can see how our butts have changed over time by looking at fossilized skeletons. This is so interesting, guys. Um, muscles leave behind a story in our bones. Some scientists now think strong and efficient gluteus maximus muscles, the muscles that we have in our butt, uh, once helped ancient people run for long distances while hunting. They were able to outrun and wear down their prey. Or maybe that strength allowed them to sprint, to snatch food that other predators killed. In other words, maybe we're kind of like vultures, like, you know, a tiger would like kill something and then the, the, the humans would like jump in there and try to take some of that animal away before whatever was eating it, right? So some, you know, some scientists are wondering if that's why we have these really, really strong butt muscles that gave us this, the ability to sprint really fast. Um, did all of that running, hunting and problem solving make us smarter? Since big brains set us apart from other animals, it's possible our butts eventually helped us make us what we are today, uniquely human. So interesting, I thought that was so interesting learning about our butts. Like we thought it was such a funny question, but yeah, it had kind of a serious answer. It's so neat that these silly, what we think is silly actually leads us on the direction to very intriguing and thought provoking answers. It's really insightful. Uh, actually, uh, we have a question for you. Uh, Kira, what inspired you to write the book and where did the questions come from? Ah, so, I mean, I got a really simple question or answer for the first question about, you know, what inspired me. I was asked by the publisher to, to write this book um, <laughs> after this one. I was asked for that one. And then that one went so well, we decided to do another book too. Um, but where did the questions come from? They came from kids. They came from kids like you. Um, so if you go into the Science Center, I'm sure a lot of you have, maybe some of you haven't, but I'm going to set the scene for you. You walk through the doors, you see, and, you know, you kind of go up an escalator, I believe, I think that's how it works, and you see a massive hall. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but you that's a wonderful hall for we're not supposed to run and all that. Man, it's fun to run and hop <laughs> in that hall. It's a really nice long hall. And at the end of that wonderful hall, you have a big atrium. And in the atrium, you got a um, a coffee shop, and it's called the Maker Bean. This coffee shop is not not an ordinary coffee shop. Um, you can actually go up to the person who's making your coffee or hot chocolate or good stuff, and they have a computer there, and you can give them a science question and they will actually put it on a coaster for you, write it into a coaster for you using this computer that they've typed your question in on. And there's, it's a, attached to a machine that actually does it for you. So this machine, this computer had all of these um, science questions from kids stored up in it, like thousands and thousands of them. So we decided, what can we do with all these wonderful questions? Okay, let's take the 50 best and turn it into a book. And that's how we did it which is pretty cool. And then Suhara, you got the manuscript and you had to do your job as well, which was taking all this information. Yeah, so my job as an illustrator is to communicate and also translate all this cool science stuff to, to everyone in, in a clear and also fun ways, right? So when I receive writing from Kira, I have to do my own research too. For example, uh, how does one of the biggest dinosaurs, Argentinosaurus, actually looked like. So I actually had to look up many, many pictures and study them, uh, you know, even to the point, how does even popcorn looks like? So I have to do a lot of research myself. So I was wearing an illustrator hat and a scientist hat to, to make this book. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Uh, thank you, thank you for answering that, those questions. And uh, it's really neat to see how, even as an illustrator, you still had to do that in-depth research. I think that's very fascinating. Uh, you know what? There's there's so many questions. You said there's 50 of them. Let's mm -hmm. get to another of the questions. 
Um, a great, great question that I, I was reading, and actually I have a related experiment, is why are flowers different colors? Oh, I love that question. And again, it was had such an interesting answer. So here is the question. Um, why are flowers different colors? And Suhara is just gonna live draw as I go. You guys can just watch her. And you know what? Here's the thing. If you're so interested in how Suhara was drawing her flowers today, and you don't even hear a thing I'm saying because you're so into what she's doing, yeah. you know what? You can always read the book later, right? That's okay. And if you can, if you guys want to draw along with Suhara now and make lots of flowers, that's awesome and make them very colorful. Okay. Why are flowers different colors? Flowers are pretty but they also have a purpose to spread their pollen and make more plants. The best way to do that, look attractive to birds or insects so they'll land on the flowers and fly away covered in powdery pollen. In some cases, flowers try to tempt specific birds or insects, which I think is so cool that, you know, there's a kind of a different insect for kind of every flower, every kind of flower. Uh, for instance, some red flowers attract birds, but not bees. Butterflies can't get enough of bright red, yellow, and orange flowers. And how about flowers that try to lure garbage-loving flies? They really exist. These species have actually evolved to look and smell like rotting meat, dark red or purple and stinky. I know, it's gross. Not all flowers are pollinated by little creatures though. Wind-pollinated flowers don't have to put on a show to attract anybody. Um, because, you know, their pollen is just flying away in, in the wind. But don't let their soft colors fool you into thinking they're dull. Because their pollen is light enough to be carried by the breeze, we breathe it in. Hello, allergies at you. <laughs> oh, oh that, that's incredible. I, I, I relate to that because actually I have allergies uh, with the yeah. hay, I get hay fever in the spring and stuff. So I, I totally relate to that. Uh, that that's such a fascinating answer, uh, and actually, it was really neat when I when I received the copy of this book and I was reading through it. It, it inspired me to do some experiments, and I hope that the teachers or parents at home who are watching that you pick up this book because when you read through it, it may think you may think of all these really cool experiments or how can I draw this. And when I heard about this one, it reminded me of this cool experiment, and I want to sh share it with you. Um, when you look at celery, for instance. Uh, celery is, looks green, but uh, I was able to take some celery and kind of change its color. Can you see that? It's pretty neat. It's like, almost like a red color. You can see it on the leaves. And I was even able to change one into that looks kind of blue as well. So if you want to learn how to change the color of celery, all you need to do is get a stalk of celery. And there's usually a root. You just cut it off so you expose the fresh part. You're going to need a cup of water. Just fill, fill it halfway and add some food coloring. About 10 drops will do. You can add a little more if you want a deeper color in your celery. All you need to do is just put the celery into the cup of water and have patience. That is the last ingredient you're going to need is patience, lots of it. But you're going to have to wait about 15, 30 minutes and then take a look at your celery and you'll start to see some results. After a day, take another look at your celery, even two days, and see it start to change color. So what's happening there? Well, plants, they need water to survive. So they actually draw up water from the roots. And I have this red celery that I kind of ripped in half. The, the water is being drawn up through these long, looks like kind of tubes, they're called xylems. And so the plant takes up all the nutrients and water through these xylems, these tubes, and as it moves up, this is called capillary action, it goes through, from through the stem and to the leaves and then evaporates through the top uh, through the top at the leaves and that's called transpiration when it evaporates it's that water that evaporates is pulling more water up through the stalk and from the roots and so this is how the water moves the is gets moved through the celery so i encourage you to try this at home i even made a, a celery that has both red and and blue on it as well and all you need to do is split the stalks and put it in two separate different cups of water. So, I mean, this, this inspires so many cool, fun experiments. Uh, in fact, there's another experiment I wanna share with you that inspired me from a question from the book. But Kira, would you mind reading the question for us? Sure. It, the, the question is, what color is sunlight? Yeah, speaking of color, right? We're still talking about color. Oh, I love color. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, so what color is sunlight? Yellow? Nope, it's white. 
Sunlight is made up of all the colors our eyes can see. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. But when they come together, our brains tell us they're white. So, I mean, I think I'm gonna leave it there. There's a little bit more about uh, how to do an experiment at home on this page, but Sean, why don't you go for it? See, show us how it's done. Oh, yes. Well, this was actually, so, uh, first of all, I love your drawing. <laughs> That's amazing. We see the white the light of the sun and yeah. I know you're using the rainbow. Do you see, I just invented this uh, rainbow crayon. I just oh. did one, um, but now yeah. I, can, I can draw with all seven colors. That is beautiful. The colors of the rainbow. And actually this experiment, when I read this question, inspired me how to create a rainbow. All you need is some sunlight. And if you don't have sunlight, just use a flashlight as well. And you need the light to pass through something to split up those colors, that white light into those different colors. So you could use a clear ornament like I have here that I put at the end of my flashlight. Or another way of doing this, which is a lot of fun, is get a bowl of water. When you get a bowl of water, take a mirror and put it inside. And then you're going to shine the flashlight <clears throat> through the water. And when you do, the water actually slows down the light and it causes it to leave at different angles. And so it splits up the colors so that you could see the colors of the rainbow. And you just adjust the mirror to project the rainbow onto anything you want. Now I'm going to use my ornament because I want to create a rainbow and I want to add it to a drawing. So if you go to the Ontario Science Center website or at anicpress.ca, you can print out this fun coloring sheet that we made that goes along with the book, or you can look at it online and color it online as well. And this is a great drawing that you did, Saharu, so, so thank you. You can see those wonderful kids playing with the sunlight. Now you may notice there's a lot of space here, and the reason why we did that is because we wanted you to add to the drawings, interpret your own things, so you can add maybe the the city of Toronto, I added a fountain, some trees in the background. And one more thing, we need to add a rainbow, but instead of coloring it, we're going to use that light. So I have my ornament on the edge of the light over here, and I am going to shine it onto my paper and make a beautiful rainbow in the city skyline. And if you do this, you, you print it out and you make a drawing, feel free to take a picture with the rainbow and share it on our social channels. We'd love to see them and share them with the rest of our audience as well. And so I encourage you to try this, uh, try this experiment at home. Uh, I do want to get to one question that one of our visitors asked. And this was this question is from Alice Keeger, and she's in grade one. And she would like to know, so how are you? Are you a Japanese illustrator? Uh, yes, I was born and raised in Japan and moved to Canada about 10 years ago. So I consider myself Japanese Canadian illustrator today. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you for answering that question from our viewers. Uh, we're going to move on because we have so many things to cover yeah. in this show. Uh, but here's one quick question for you, Kira. What was the process for answering the questions? Uh, because this was a great resource for teachers. So for answering the questions in the book, what was the process for answering those questions? Oh, that's such a good question, actually, because a lot of people don't know how these books are created. Um, so I'm a journalist by trade. I went to school for it. I've been a journalist for about 25 years. And so what I'm really good at is asking questions. That's what I what I do for a living is I ask people questions. So that's exactly, I took these questions that the kids came up with and then I called people to the Science Center, um, the educators, researchers, people there at the Science Center who are really the experts. I'm experts at asking questions, ask, expert at asking questions, but not necessarily about answering these. Um, and you guys gave me fantastic answers to the questions. I recorded everything. Hey, I'm in my office. I can actually show you what I used here. So I'm gonna open my desk. That's the wonderful thing about you guys being in my office today. I used this little recorder and I would tape our phone calls and everything you guys talked about, it was um, recorded. And then somebody might- It was amazing. Myself. Yeah, yeah. And every single word that everybody said was actually was actually transcribed, uh, typed up. So I would have pages and pages and pages of all of your answers. And then I would take all that information you guys gave me and then I created the answers and then did more research myself just to make sure I had some extra stuff. And then you guys looked at it like it, it was a long, long process. And then, you know, Sahar, you came in too and, and did exactly what you were saying before when we sent you the manuscript. Yeah. Lots of people are involved in this. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was a it was a labor of love. Actually, it was so so much fun to work with, uh, with work with you guys and uh, answer these questions. And uh, I look forward to you answering more questions. It's just it's just so much fun. Um, actually, 
one of those questions that I was looking at, um, there was a kind of, we get some gross questions. I thought this one was, was a lot of fun. How many times can you spin before you puke? Yeah, yeah, that was one of my favorite questions. We <laughs> have to do that. We have to do that. Okay, so what I want everybody to do now, now we're gonna do an experiment, but it's going to be experiment light. We're not really going to do this full experiment. We're gonna, I'm gonna ask everybody, if you can stand up, or you can be like me, who was in a little chair that tends to swivel. We're all gonna turn around once or twice, okay? We're all gonna turn around where you are at home. Suksar, Suhara doesn't have to because she's drawing. Okay, <laughs> I can only do two because I have to, you know, I know Sean, right? <laughs> Be careful, be careful. And everybody sit down now and everybody be safe, okay? You don't want any accidents. Um, and I'm only gonna um, spin twice because I, I have to read and I actually have to have a brain to do this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how many times can you spin before you puke? One, two, three, we. The number of times a person can spin before feeling sick, called motion sickness, is different for everyone. Although we do know that kids, women, and people who get migraines are more likely to vomit than others. So I'm sorry, kids, you're more likely to vomit. Uh, motion sickness happens when your brain experiences a clash between your senses. For example, if you're spinning on a ride at a theme park, which I love, I love, I love theme park, your eyes might see the world go by in a whir by in a blur, in a wild blur. But your brain is thinking, whoa, I'm just sitting here. My muscles aren't doing anything. Meanwhile, the fluid deep inside your inner ear has a big role to play in motion sickness, especially the moment you put the brakes on. When you spin, the fluid inside your ear, that spins too. But when you suddenly stop, that fluid keeps going, you know, it, it, it just keeps going even though the rest of your body is actually stopped. While your other senses know you're no longer moving, your inner ears tell your central nervous system a whole different story. The brain can't handle so many mixed signals, so it feels sick until the fluid settles down. And what's so cool, like if you guys are spinning there one way, um, so yeah, the, your, your body has stopped, your, the fluid inside your in, inner ear is still spinning, but let's say you decide to stop and you sort of spin the other way. Have you guys ever done that where you spin the other way just to sort of <laughs> help to calm down? That's the, that's happening, right? You, so you're spinning the other way, so you're getting the fluid inside your inner ear to stop okay. spinning um, in one direction. You've kind of given it a break by, by doing that, by spinning in the other direction. So that's why it stops when you spin the other way. <laughs> That's so cool. And I love the drawing that you did, Saharu. And yeah. you can even show what's going on inside the ear. Yeah. And I know that inside the ears, that's where the smallest bones are located. You can see the, the fluid moving around in there as well. And I, we actually had a question about the fluid moving in your ear from one of our viewers. So that actually answered that question. In fact, we're getting lots of great questions from our viewers on all sorts of different topics and stuff. And, you know, these may inspire future questions for future books as well. Uh, one of them is, uh, how do we generate electricity? I know that there's so many different ways of generating electricity, and we have generators that do that. And the main idea behind that is the generator needs to spin and produce the electricity that runs through uh, power lines or current that comes to our home. And there's a way, different ways of spinning those generators, whether you use wind turbines or you could use uh, solar power and use solar cells. Um, there's even nuclear energy, which produces steam to spin these generators. So there's so many different ways. And that was a great question from a, a, from a grade three class. There is another question is why is outer uh, space so cold? It's so cold out there because there's no heat around it except produced by suns. And suns are like nuclear furnaces. They have lots and lots of heat. So if you're closer you are to a sun or a star, I should say, because our sun is a star, uh, there's a lot of heat there, but for far away, then you're not exposed to that heat and it does get really cold. So that's why it's really, really cold out there in space. Uh, so th those are just some of the questions our viewers are asking us. And in fact, with all these questions, uh, Kira, you must have a favorite question that's in, in your book. I do, I do. I have a favorite question because the, the story that goes along with it is so interesting. I've always loved dinosaurs. I was such a dinosaur kid. Like, in fact, the first book I ever wrote for real was grade two, and it was a nonfiction book about dinosaurs. And it opened up the wrong way, and it wasn't awesome, but it was like fantastic, because I got to read my book to the class, which was my first presentation to, to a class, which was cool. Anyway, <laughs> but this book is about dinosaurs and sharks, which is a, I don't know, sharks are cool too, right? They have a whole, uh, 
whole channels talking about sharks on television half the time. So yeah. <laughs> pretty awesome. Okay, so the question is, why didn't sharks become extinct with the dinosaurs? Yeah, pretty cool. Sharks were actually around before dinosaurs and they didn't become extinct. So no one knows for sure, but experts have a few ideas. So let's start with what we do know. Sharks are amazing creatures. As a group, they've been around for at least 420 million years, making them much older than dinosaurs and even Mount Everest. Yep, sharks are older than Mount Everest. By the time the asteroid slammed into Earth 66 million years ago, destroying the dinosaurs and the other animals, sharks had already lived through other horrible mass, extinct, uh, mass extinction disasters including one time when the ocean lost nearly all of its oxygen. So there have actually been more than one mass extinction event. Like we always think about the asteroids slamming into the earth and killing the dinosaurs, but there were four others as well. And the, and the sharks were around for, uh, they, it actually got through four of the five. So that's a pretty wild thing to think about. So that's not to say the asteroid impact was a picnic for sharks though. It hit our planet 66 million years ago with the energy of a billion nuclear bombs. The resulting earthquakes were so violent, they actually shot dinosaurs, dinosaurs, huge dinosaurs into the air. So you can just imagine how much energy that was. Forests all around North America burned to the ground. Winds swept harsher and faster than any hurricane humans have ever experienced. Dark ash swirled through the atmosphere and blocked the sun. So many surviving plants eventually died. It's now estimated that at least 70% of all animal species went extinct, including many species of sharks. But a handful survived, along with some fish, frogs, burrowing mammals, birds, turtles, and crocodiles. Scientists think some of the surviving sharks may have dived down deep into the ocean to escape the destruction up above. Sharks are born with the ability to feel vibrations in the water. Did they sense the danger coming and swim down really fast? The disaster may have also created more food for sharks, not less. Tiny creatures at the bottom of their food chain ate all of those decaying plants that were dying because of what was going on above. Fish ate these little critters and the sharks ate the fish, so they didn't starve. So today sharks are facing a new danger. So what do you guys think? What could be a new danger that sharks are facing now? Yeah, hmm. I, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hunt, so, hunting? They're being hunted? That's a good, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. You know, basically, who's the new danger? Us. We're the people. The people are the new danger. Between overfishing and pollution, many shark species are in trouble. Will they use their same adapting skill, though, to survive us? I have a lot of hope for sharks. I think, no, I mean, granted, okay, let's just be clear. I want the earth to to survive and do really, really well under our stewardship, uh, under people's stewardship as well, and have all the animals that are on the planet right now. But even if anything goes sideways, those sharks are gonna be around in my opinion. You know, they'll be here millions of years from now. Yeah, they are survivors. Yes. They know how to survive. And I mean, I, can I just comment on those beautiful illustrations? Uh -huh. I love the dinosaur and the shark below. It's just so, so incredible how, how these things go through your mind and you're able to illustrate it and make it come to life on, on just a canvas, just a 2D canvas. It's just so fascinating. And I love the comments and the, and the, the volcano, just just amazing, so hard. Uh, what, what inspired this drawing when you were reading it, like uh, to focus on the, the shark and the dinosaur? What, what, what came to mind when you were listening to that? Uh, it's something that I always think about, especially when I was working on this book. My, my job is to not only to communicate those scientific facts to people, but I'm always thinking, how can I make learning fun and engaging and accessible to everyone? Because some people learn better by looking at pictures. So I'm always thinking about how can we make this topic really fun and engaging? So I was having fun drawing. So that's usually what I'm thinking about. How can I make, how can I have fun, like me having fun, while joining, and I'm, I'm hoping that everyone else can have fun with me. That's great. Uh, we actually have two questions that, uh, that I want to share from our audience before we go. The first question is, why can't you breathe in space? Um, I actually, I mean, 
what we need to breathe is oxygen and there's no oxygen in space, unfortunately, and it's really cold. So because there's no oxygen in space for us to breathe, uh, that's why we can't breathe in. It's the, there's no air, unlike on Earth, which is made up with the nitrogen and oxygen that we use. Uh, there's none in space. So that's a great question from our, our grade three class, Miss Pugu's uh, grade three class. And the other question, actually, I want to give to you, Kira, if you could answer this one. And it's from Lisa Graham, and a grade three student of hers named Richard. He wants to know, how does science work? <laughs> <laughs> How does science work? What a really good question. Science is not a, um, it's not a class. It's not, it's a way of looking at the world and a way of understanding the world. That's how I think of how science works. So what you have to do in order for, to use science in order to answer questions is you have to ask, you have to test, and you have to repeat. So you have to ask your questions, you have to test them to see what, you have to have an idea, a hypothesis to see, okay, yeah, ask, test, repeat, there you've got the, <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. Um, you test your theories, you try to figure out how it all works, and then if you, you then you have to repeat it, the your experiment again and again and again, just to make sure that you get the same results every time. And the way that science does a beautiful job of creating um, new innovations is you have all these people from around the world working together, let's say vaccines, we've been seeing that lately, around the world, and they're building on science that happened before, building on experiments that happened before. So nobody's working in a bubble, everybody's really working together over generations too. There might be some science that somebody came up with, uh, something, uh, an understanding that they came up with 200 years ago, and that's informing, that's like having an impact on the science that we're doing today, which is so exciting. Like we're all connected in, in science, it's very cool. Th thank you so much. Uh, and you're absolutely right. We are all uh, connected in science. And I, we had so many great questions from our audience. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But uh, I want to encourage our audience to continue to ask questions. And if any of you were drawing along with Saharu, please tag us uh, in the comments section or even on our social channels. We would love to see them and share them with everyone else. Also, if uh, you're inspired by the book and you end up doing any of the experiments, also tag us with some fix pictures of your experiments. We'd love to see those as well. And if you want a copy of the book, once again, Why Does My Shadow Follow Me? It's available right now. You could go check it out through our Ontario Science Center website at ontariosciencecenter.ca or uh, the Anik Press website at anikpress.ca as well. So on behalf of Kira, Saharu, and myself, we'd like to thank you all for joining us today and continue asking questions.